to the Mara Triangle in Kenya. We are with the River Pride that are moving through the open area here. My name is Steve and this is Wild Wonderland. Magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good morning and welcome back once again to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry, enormous James is on camera, and we're sitting with a magnificent pride of lions, the Salt Lake Pride. They killed at least two wildebeest last night, so it's been a very good time for them. We are coming to you live from three spectacular locations throughout Africa. Here, the Masai Mara in Kenya, just to the south of us, the Serengeti in Tanzania, and another two and a half thousand kilometers south of that, the Western Kruger Park of South Africa. Now you are the most important part of any live safari, being our live audience, and it's very important, please, that you talk to us throughout the show. Let's have a look at these lines and I'll tell you how you can talk to us. You do that using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildWonderland on Twitter. So that's the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildWonderland on Twitter. You can send us any questions or any comments that you might have about these astounding animals that we're seeing. Just over the hill, there are about 10,000 wildebeest, I think, and we're going to head there very soon to see what's happening there. This time of year is a particular highlight for wildlife enthusiasts all over the world. It's possibly nature's greatest spectacle, and that is the great wildebeest migration. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded Gnu, bleating songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Jumbo, jumbo, ni hao, ni hao. Hello, hello, everybody. And how are you all doing? And it's wonderful to see the migration that is happening currently in the Masai Mara of Kenya. And these lions are enjoying every bit of that. My name is David, and on camera with me is Bungay. Bungay, how are you? And we are very excited to show one of my favorite prides here in the Masai Mara is a pride of lions that we call the sausage tree. It's five females and they got 10 cubs with them and they're just walking through the tall red oat grass. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to you live from the Masimara and this is an amazing wild wonderland show. Look at that young boy there. 
very close to the vehicle, say five meters, and that's a lot of trust they got with us. And remember, as I ducked down to go to my position and to watch these elephants, I mean, these lions cross the grass, sorry. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, should you have any questions or comments, you may send them through using hashtags CGTN Wild or Wild Wonderland. Very excited to see lions walking in the grass. Not sure why I call them elephants, but I think it's out of excitement. Well, I want to follow them slowly and find out where they could be going. And in the meantime, we'll send you all the way to South Africa to my friend, Trishala. Good morning, everyone, and look at this quite sad scene. We have a little antelope called a diker that is stuck in the mud up here in the north of the Sabi Sand in the Kruger area of South Africa. And that's where I am right now. My name is Trishala and I have Sebastian on camera with me. And we are really excited, of course, to bring you the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. So this is happening right now. Now we're sitting here and we're gonna watch this Daika and you can see that she's fairly distressed. And she's trying desperately to get out there. You have one leg up. Come on, girl, you can do it. We have no idea how long it's been stuck in here. But your one leg is now out. She must be freezing cold. She must be tired. She must have been trying for so long to get out of the spot. And the thing is, out here in the African bush, the risks are just so high. There is actually a leopard close by. Yeah. Paula, you say, poor thing, it certainly is. It's very, very sad to see. And it seems like the more she tries, the more she gets stuck and bogged down in that mud. Now we're going to be rooting for her. And we hope that the leopard that is in the vicinity does not catch off of her. But you see, she's been very silent. She's not distress calling. She's not making any kind of noise that will signal to predators nearby that something is wrong. Because as soon as she does that, any predator nearby will lift up their head, perk up their ears, and know exactly where to come. Every now and then she just flops her head down onto the soil and hopes that she she will actually be able to get out. Ah, oh, Lara Moore, you'd like to know if any of the buffaloes went past here. I only saw the buffaloes more in the central area near Galago Pan and then up at Vuyatela Pan. Oh, go, go. Go, go. But I'm not sure if they've come down here. I don't see many buffalo tracks here at the moment, at least not fresh ones. So she must have just come down to get a drink. You know, it's the dry season for us. It's winter. You can see that all the dried mud around her. So she must have gone to this one patch that had a little bit of water, put her head down, and then just slid in and become stuck. So who knows what will happen. We're going to sit around and wait with her. Maybe she'll get out, or maybe a predator will come along. But while we sit here and wait, let me send you up to Steve in the Masai Mara and see what he's getting up to. Thanks, Trish. Such dramatic scenes down there. It's never nice to see an individual caught in the mud like that, but it is part and parcel of what happens in the dry season. And up here in the Mara Triangle, everybody, we have found a very old and scraggly-looking jackal. See, the tips of the ears are missing. It's very relaxed. It's busy sniffing around the base of this tree. And that prior lions we had before were actually here somewhere. So probably sniffing, trying to pick up some scraps from whatever the lions left beyond, behind. My name is Steve Falkenbridge, joined by Jandre Gearing on camera. Good morning, everybody. Again, welcome to the Mara Triangle. A beautiful morning we are having here. We are surrounded by all sorts of sights. We're hoping to try and find you. But this is very special to have a jackal right next to us here. Very relaxed completely un, unconcerned by our presence. But I've never seen a jackal with its ears clipped like that. I'm not sure what has happened. 
possibly just age. Might have been many, many fights. Jackal are very territorial. Male and female will defend a territory against other jackal of the same sex. The male fighting other males and the female fighting other females. They can be quite aggressive in that regard. But we're going to carry on around here. We're going to move up, try and find you a beautiful herd of buffalo. In the meantime, let's jump down one country to the Serengeti to say good morning to Tristan. Indeed, Steve. Well, hopefully you'll find them. We actually had some buffalo not too far from here, but what you can see is that there is a lion on what is one of the most magnificent rocks that we have. He's actually just stood up now, and he's not alone up there. There is a female too, and they have been mating this morning. It really is spectacular to see them up on this rock. Now, hopefully what's going to happen is he's going to find the female, and she's going to stand up, and we'll actually see them mating. But while he kind of sniffs around and looks, best to tell you who I am. My name is Tristan. On camera, I've got David, and it is a very big Welcome to the Serengeti in Tanzania. It is an absolutely wonderful place to be on safari. These rocks just make it that much better. It is seriously, seriously beautiful to be out here. And when you get rocks like that, coupled with lions on top of it, it is as good as it gets. Now, unfortunately, the male has just slipped in behind a little edging on the rock. This rock is absolutely massive. And so it's very difficult to see where they are. But I think there comes the male. Look at that. Isn't that just the most magnificent scene? He is absolutely beautiful on top of that rock. Now, this boy has been very busy when it comes to mating. The female that he's mating with now is not the same female that he mated with all of last week. He spent about five days mating with a female that has no tail, which is part of the same pride, and he's now managed to find himself another female, which is amazing. Right, we're going to sit here and watch this regal, regal line on top of his rock. In the meantime, though, we're going to send you back down to South Africa and Jamie, who's using her two feet to move around. Excitement comes in all shapes and sizes and forms when you are enjoying the wilderness, whether it's watching a regal lion standing on a rock or whether it's looking at incredibly fresh leopard tracks. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Craig and we're out on foot searching for the big things and the little things as well. But in the search for animals, we often find ourselves staring at the dirt because it's a little bit like a newspaper. So we come out in the morning and we have a look at what's happened overnight. And something very, very important here, it might seem a little bit disgusting, but this over here is a very, very fresh example of what actually looks like it might have been just a little bit of leopard scat. Now I'm looking at footprints in the sand here and we haven't done any tracks yet so let me show you very quickly this is a leopard track here it's a beautiful leopard track it is crisp and fresh her toes are here one two three and four and I know it's a leopard track by the three lobes at the back as well as the size and I know that it's a female by the size now if we look along a little bit and you'll see there's lots of footprints around here because I've been staring at these tracks for a while now if we look here you can see how crisp this outline is it's very very clear that means that this leopard was here probably less than an hour ago so I'm gonna go and see if I can find her in the meantime we're gonna send you back across to the Masai Mara to rejoin James And you, yeah, no. Here we are sitting in amongst the great herds of the migration. Just listen to them. <laughs> and for two or three months, this is all you can hear. Bah, bah, bah. Sometimes the zebra making a sort of half donkey half bird-like sound. Look at them all. Now just to give you those numbers again, 1.2 million of these wildebeest come out of the Serengeti into the Masai Mara and we're looking due south now towards the Serengeti and in fact there are still many many still in the Serengeti and we've heard that there might be a cheetah down there on the border so we're going to go down there and see if we can find that cheetah. 
Unlikely a cheetah will spend a lot of time hunting the herds because they're a little bit big. There's a bit of a battle going on here, James, look. We've got two bull wildebeest having a bit of a fight. But the cheetah will certainly take the rear guard of the migration and those of the Thompson's gazelles. These two bulls are just sorting out who's in charge. Remember, any questions you want to ask, we'd love to hear from you. Hashtag CGTN Wild or CGTN or hashtag Wild Wonderland on Twitter. Righty, David Gathambagithu is about, I'm going to say, 10 kilometers off to the west of we, where we are now. You're going to go back to him, we're going to head south. Welcome to this other part of the Mara. Yes, I'm uh, uh, in the west, and good luck to James. Hopefully, he is going to get a cheetah for all of us. Now, the lions are still on the walk, and you can see how tall this red oat grass is. They might easily disappear in the grass there unless you look very carefully. Boom, seeing them flicking their tails like that, that's always what helps us to be able to spot them. Otherwise, if I had not seen them, they just disappeared. See that? Now, here in the Mara, the migration takes about one year to come. The last time it was here, it was last year, around uh, September, October, and the migration is right back, and it's always exciting when these lions in the Mara wait for the migration. Dawn is a special time to be with the lion pride in East Africa. The waving grasses, lion's coats, and rising sun make a hundred shades of gold. Stunning as this scene is, the pride suffer a lean few months in the long grass before the migration. But the arrival of the herds bring relief to hard-working mothers. Hunting is easier with the plentiful wildebeest and zebra, cubs fatten, content and playful. The bounty of the migration season strengthens and fortifies the prides while giving them valuable experience. Experience they will need to navigate the immense challenges of the East African plains. The bush it can definitely be a harsh place and many, many herbivores get taken down during the migration. And down here in South Africa, where we are right now, the stiker is still struggling to get out of the little pickle she's gotten herself into. But luckily for her, the leopard that is close by has moved just a little bit to the west of her, and not coming straight towards her. Of course, like I said, she wouldn't have known that she's here just yet. But if she manages to stroll this way, she will get a meal, no doubt. But then also, the presence... Oh, there you go, there you go. Maybe, maybe you'll make it out. Annette, you'd like to know what the chances are that she'll get out? I mean, really, it is 50-50, either she will or she won't. But seeing her struggle like this, it's seeing the mud around her move. Though it looks fairly soddle, uh, solid, especially the, around the front of her, as she moves, you'll actually be able to see the mud kind of gooey, and it moves with her, which is telling us that it's waterlogged. Come on, girl. Look at her try. Oh, so close. And look, at she's so tired. She's resting her head now. And she's also so alert because she's scared but it does not look good for her. You see those back legs are the ones that need to propel her out while the front ones will pull her out. So it's a very difficult thing and I don't know if she will actually be able to get out, but we will stay with her and tell you the story and watch it unfold. And we do hope that she does get out, but if not, maybe one of our leopards or lions will get a meal. A meal. Robin, you say that she, you hope that she gets out? She is definitely, or well, we are definitely rooting for her. Come on, girl. You can do it. 
She keeps licking her lips because there's mud all around her face because she keeps slipping. Oh gosh, it really is sad. But we're going to stick around with her a little longer and see how she does. See if that leopard comes along. By the meantime, I'll send you up to Tristan in Tanzania and see how he's doing. Well, I hope that that dike does get out. It's an incredible struggle that it's undergoing. And just to see the will to live is quite something on an animal like that. And the fact that we get to experience it live in Africa is absolutely amazing with all of you. And so this is a reminder that we are in the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. And there's no better way for me to celebrate the Serengeti than to have a lion on a rock like this. I'd been hoping that this week we would get this particular scenario playing out. And this male lion is just posing better than we could ever imagine. You can see he's got his nose up. There's a bit of a breeze that's blowing at the moment and he's sniffing around. Now, where we are at the moment, there are some wildebeest that are not too far. So it's a few small herds that are around as well as some buffalo. And it might be that that he's picking up on the, on the wind. Up there, he's got a seriously big vantage point as well as the fact that he's able to smell things and see things quite a long way away. And so if he's hungry and potentially wants to go and hunt, he's able to then pick those up. The other side of it is, is that if there is any sort of uh, other predator that's around, then he obviously can see it from up there as well. Now, he does have a coalition member. There's two males that are hanging around this particular section that we're in. Um, and so it's very possible that maybe he spotted his coalition member close by. Right. Now, James, how does the Tanzania ecosystem differ? Well, and that's from the Mara. Well, James, the thing about the, the northern Serengeti or well, the Serengeti in general, is that the Serengeti in general is very, very diverse. Because it's so large, it's got different areas that are very, very different in many ways. Where we are based at the moment is the northern Serengeti. And the northern Serengeti and the Masai Mara, even though they're so close, they do not feel or look the same at all. The northern Serengeti has got these big rocky outcrops all over the place. They are inundated with these rocky outcrops and you have a lot more woodland in this area. A lot of acacia um, tortillas that you get in this section and it makes it look very, very, very different to what you see in the Mara. The Mara is more of those open rolling grasslands that everyone kind of associates East Africa with whereas this Serengeti section you've got more of these rocky outcrops um, and in between that sort of woodland areas and then the grasslands in between all of that so it's a, it's a very different feel that you get from here than you would get in the Maasai Mara and for me this is one of the most spectacular landscapes that I've had the pleasure of spending time in these rocks and, and just the way that it is around here is just absolutely beautiful right now our male lion has decided to hide behind the rock for a little bit so we'll just be patient and wait I'm pretty sure they're going to come out and mate at some point and so while we be patient let's send you back up to the Mara with Steve and see how he's getting on thanks Tristan we are indeed with a fantastic herd of elephants right here next to the road you can actually hear them eating grazing the grass in the marsh area it's very very wet and muddy underfoot here there's no off-road driving in this area because well, first of all we'd get very stuck and second of all it's a very sensitive area being quite close to the river so we're quite close to the river. We can't really see the long undulating hills Tristan was mentioning about the Mara in comparison to that of the sort of rocky outcrops and wooded hills of the Serengeti. But beautiful nonetheless and nothing prettier than a herd of elephants out in this landscape. Beautiful female here using her trunk to graze quite efficiently smelling actually as she goes looking for the best bit of grass almost like choosing her favorite candy out of the packet we'll see how she uses her trunk to sniff You're not really using her eyes at all just moves the tip of the trunk around until she finds exactly what she's looking for and a very very keen sense of smell elephants and they know each plant intimately and which one tastes sweeter and although they are very large animals, they are extremely selective. 
We're going to stay here with this herd of elephants and try and provide you with some more beautiful shots. And in the meantime, the cleanup crew, James, is visualizing some vultures in a tree. You can come back to your strategic village tomorrow. Right, we have got the aerial cleanup crew now observing the herds and they're waiting for something to drop dead or be killed. Now, what's very interesting and something that very few people realize is that 60% of the death that happens during this migration happens extra to predators. In other words, animals dying of old age, sickness, injury, being trampled by one another, that sort of thing. And that is why in or outside of migration season, there really aren't very many vultures in the Masai Mara. But as soon as the migration arrives, then the vultures come with them. And these chaps are very fat and very full. We've got two species of vulture up there. I think we've got Rupel's griffins. That's the one on the far right. And we've got white-backed vultures. Uh, just second from the right, there's a white-backed. You can just see the little bit of white on its back there. Gorgeous birds. And unfortunately, highly endangered. Now, let's go and learn a little bit more about the Mara cleanup crew. We are going to head off to a cheetah. I've just seen it in the distance. The Masai Mara is abundant beyond imagining. Numberless creatures thrive there, prey, predator, and scavenger, great and small. Many in the sweeping migration herds will not make the return journey. For the ravenous aerial cleanup crew, the migration is a bountiful feast. While the predators kill some, many die from drowning, illness, injury, and even old age. Thousands of vultures swoop in from the East African skies to devour the carcasses. The enormous leopard faced dominates, while Rupel's griffins, white backed, and hooded squabble for the scraps. Jackals and storks also enter the fray. When the unruly banquet is over, the vultures of the Mara will once again take to the endless blue vault of Africa. Lots of scavengers are around when animals are vulnerable, just like this girl right here. Now, there's also the potential, of course, for hyenas to come down. And there is a den nearby, but we've just heard that Tandi, the female leopard in this area, is about 200 meters away. How unbelievable is that? And remember that this is happening right now in the Kruger area of South Africa. And it is, of course, the CGT and Wild Wonderland live show. So you can interact with us, you can talk to us using the hashtag CGT and Wild and hashtag Wild Wonderland. We love to get your questions. Oh, come on, girl. She's so tired and she is frigid. She was shivering earlier on. She couldn't control herself, and you can see that now her neck is really wet. She's constantly been resting it down. There, she's shivering again. Andy, you'd like to know if anyone can help her out. We can't help her out because our role here is to observe and watch nature takes it, take its course and it's not to interfere. And I know it always feels like we should be helping and doing the right thing in our heads. But in fact, by helping this Dekka out, you are doing a disservice to an animal who may need a meal. Maybe a leopard or a lion is desperate nearby and they need a meal. So it's always a catch-22. If you help this Dekka out, you're taking something away from the lion. You help the lion out and then you're taking something away from the Dekka. So there's always something that can benefit from an animal that's in distress. It, it seems, you know, as if we are 
being unhelpful, but in fact, we are just here to watch. We are not here to interfere. We're here to observe everything that goes on in nature. And unfortunately, it is part of it. But like I said, it is the circle of life. It all comes round. So we're going to sit tight, and wait for Tandi and see if she comes here. But I'm going to send you to David in the Masai Mara because he's got something that's a bit more happy than this right now. Well, very sorry for that, Daika, but sometimes we'll always allow, you know, nature to take its mm -hmm. own course. Did you hear that? The slayers just went. Oh. Anyway, for those of you who could be joining us now, my name is David, and we're coming to you live from the Massimar of Kenya, and on camera with me today is Bungay. We got a pair of lions here, which came in the open earlier. They are all walking in the grass, but they have come to a very nice place. And we saw the adults, but now we got all the cubs there. Not all of them, because in this particular pride, we got 10 cubs. At the moment, I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, with that one female who looks to be very sleepy. She's just enjoying the sunshine. And of all the social cats we know in Africa, lions are very social. White Lady Leon, <clears throat> we got four sets of cubs here. And the oldest are about one year. And those are two, and there's one that is 10 months old and we got another four that are about six months and we got another three that are about four months old it's a lovely question and i was saying earlier how social the lions are including their own cubs so you might get one female may suckle cubs that are not its own biologically and we call that allo nursing or allo suckling and I've just come in there and just had a rest. No, we haven't seen the male of this particular pride. And what we're trying to do is to wait and see if the male will come around. They had a kill two days ago, and what would happen, they might take another two or three, four days ago before they bring another kill down, which was a buffalo, as much as we got lots of wildebeest, but none around this area. We'll continue waiting here to see if all of them will come in this nice open place, but in the meantime, we'll take you to the other side of the Mara to my friend Steve, who got some elephants and some impalas. Thanks, Gigi, and you are all still here with us live watching the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show with some impala here and elephants. Quintessential African experience to very common savanna species. And to have them here in one shot is quite spectacular. And again, my name is Steve Falkenbridge, joined by Jandre, and we are having an absolutely fantastic morning here down close to the Mara River. We are quite far in the northern parts of the Mara Triangle itself, and the tree line you can see off to the left there is, in fact, uh, the tree line that runs along the Mara River. Uh, the major and only sort of main area of forest left along the Mara River itself is from here to sort of the Serena area. Uh, the majority of it all the way along its length has been removed. So some very nice indigenous forest along the rivers, lovely bird calls, beautiful habitat, uh, impala, love these sort of edges along tree thickets and open areas and that is what impala love so much. And an animal that we spend a lot of time with that loves catching impala, well James seems to have found some. This is a very special time. We have found two male cheetah, and they are known as the border boys. They live here 
sort of between Tanzania and Kenya, on the borders between the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got enormous James. That's his thumb over there. And it's a huge privilege to have you with us on CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. There are our two cheetah. Now in this particular area, the grass has been extremely long and over the last few weeks we've been searching consistently for these two guys. But you'll find that they haven't been here because the grass has been too long. They like to hunt in short grass, like the grass you can see around us. And as the herds have moved up through the area, so the grass has got shorter and shorter, and the two border boys have moved back up into the area. As I said to you a little earlier, they're not hugely enthusiastic about wildebeest because they're a little bit big. They would certainly take a young wildebeest, especially two of them, but you'll probably find that they're eating uh, more Thompson's gazelles and sometimes baby wildebeest. And their big fat bellies tells me that these two chaps have eaten probably in the last day or so. And so the chances of them getting up to hunt something are not very high, but they're certainly not impossible. All of these predators will do their best to catch something if, they come, if something comes past, so they're opportunists. Now, they're not doing very much, but we have not been spending time in this area uh, for no reason. We've been spending time a lot around cheetah. The wide open plains are the playgrounds for Africa's coursing cat, the cheetah. They are often solitary, but sisters will live together until adolescence, while brothers often form lifelong coalitions. The prey they hunt depends on whether they live alone or in groups. Selecting a victim is a painstaking and careful process. At full stretch, the cheetah is a blur of spots. To stay at top speed, the tail whirls to counterbalance the cat's change in direction. Despite their immense speed and agility, only about 40% of chases are successful. The hunt is not over with the chase, however. Wrestling is a necessary skill. And the cheetah is built for speed, not power. Cheetah must also eat fast to avoid thieving scavengers. Only after the meal can this captivating cat rest. Look, 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 look at this. Look at what we've got from one spotted cat in the Maasai Mara to another here in the greater Kruger. And not only are we looking at a leopard, but we are looking at a leopard on foot. And he's looking straight back at us. And this is what is so magical about Hosanna. Do you know how few people get to experience this in their lifetime? And you're watching it live here on CGTN's Wild Wonderland, where Hosanna is looking right at us. Oh, just a quick reintroduction. My name is Jamie. Behind the camera is a Craig. And we're looking at Leopard. He's looking at us now through the branches we're probably around about 30 or so meters away this is hosana you met him yesterday with trishala and the reason that we can do this is because we have followed hosana from pretty much the day he was born although obviously not on foot then but from around about when he was six weeks old we spent time with this lovely leopard on foot as well as his sister and because his mother was so beautifully relaxed, in the end we found ourselves in a position like this that very, very few people ever get to experience leopards are notoriously shy. And he's actually not even looking at us now, he's ignoring us. This is astounding. Vivian, you want to know how fast a leopard can run, Vivian? They say that they have been recorded going at speeds of 24 meters per second. 24 meters per second. 
Um, that's only obviously for short bursts. Probably in terms of their running speed, you're looking at around about 60 to 80 kilometers an hour at their sort of top speeds, but they can't maintain that for very, very long. Leopards are ambush predators. They're all about power and surprise. And he could cover this distance between myself and him in just a blink of an eye. And although we know that Hassan is relaxed, we know that he's also getting older, his hormones are starting to flow, and we don't take his presence for granted. He's still a wild animal. It's just one that we happen to be able to get close to an experience like this. This is fantastic. All the way across on the other side of this beautiful piece of land that we call home, Trishala is sitting worth waiting for Hosanna's older sister. Now, I must say that our Deka is doing a little bit better. Perhaps she's warmed up now that the sun is out and she's got a bit more energy because she's putting both her front legs up onto that little bit. There we go. There we go. And she almost picked herself up. There we go. Come on, girl. And she stopped shivering a little bit now. She's warmed up. And luckily for her, and he's still moving in this direction, but hasn't got her just now. Now, my name is Trishala with Sebastian and Cameron. Remember, we're live with you right here in the Kruger area of South Africa. So this is happening right now. How exciting is that? Now, communicate with us. Remember, hashtag Wild Wonderland and hashtag CGTN Wild. We'd love to hear what questions you have about what's going on now. Something has gotten her attention. She'll be very, very weary. There we go, girl. MGN, you'd like to know if a leopard would get stuck in there. A leopard could get stuck in there, but remember, a leopard is much bigger. So this animal is only about 20 kgs. It's a female tiger. And she's got hooves that are probably filled with mud right now. So she's slipping and sliding. A leopard might be able to push out its claws, be able to grab a little more, but also they've got a strong tail that may be able to help them out in getting out of here. But antelope are particularly vulnerable and often do slide in. Exciting stuff. Well, we hope she makes it. We will sit here with her and root for her. But let me send you up to James in the Maasai Mara while I sit here and wait. Now, leopards and cheetah are, of course, very, very different. They look superficially similar, but they are, in fact, very different. And the first difference is this amazingly flexible neck. Because they are so vulnerable, they have to be able to look up while they're sleeping. And so they can relax, but at the same time, cock their heads up at about 90 degrees. Now, if you were to try the same thing, if you were to lie on your side and then try and lift your head up, you'd very quickly get a pain in your neck and have to put your head back down. Cheetah are not like that. They can lie with their heads at this really unusual angle. Leopards, not so much. The big difference, though, is the complete over-specialization of this animal. This is a complete specialist. It's specialized entirely to catch animals in a speedy chase across plains like this. A leopard, however, is able to use a multitude of different habitat types. They can live in true forest, they can live almost in true desert, they can eat anything from termites up to the size of small giraffe sometimes. Cheetah have a much narrower dietary choice and they're totally over-specialized for speed. And it means that they can live in much more limited areas. They can only stay in areas where the habitat is very perfect for them. And that's why we don't see them as much as we see leopards and why they are not nearly as uh, widely distributed as leopards. Aren't they wonderful cats? Siobhan, we know actually that cheetah do cross rivers. 
We've never seen them cross the Mara River. We've definitely seen them crossing the Talek River, which is just up uh, stream of the Masai Mara or of the Mara River. It's a tributary. We do know, however, that others have seen cheetahs trying to cross the Mara, and they're not superb swimmers. We know of at least one cheetah that's been drowned while trying to cross a raging river. So they're not the best swimmers. They can swim if they have to, and they do cross water if they have to, but they don't enjoy it. They're like most cats, you know. They just don't like to be in water. We'll sit with these guys. I don't think they're going to get up and go anywhere, but let's go across to Steve's cats, who are slightly more active. Well, thank you very much, James. We've managed to find ourselves another lioness. The trick in the Mara for finding animals is to have a good pair of binoculars, and whenever you stop, you scan. But have a look at the number of flies on her face. Uh, there on her belly, she's got a wound as well. Lots of flies. Oh, there we go. Flies all over the place. But look at that wound on the side of her hip. That is the kind of wound uh, that an animal will get when a horn is uh, thrust into them. Uh, most of the time, lions, when they chase animals, the animals run away. But every now and again, buffalo, wildebeest and the like will actually turn on the lion and use their horns. And when the lion turns to run, they quite often get gouged in the stomach or in the back of the legs. And sometimes, if it's in the stomach, it can be actually quite fatal, ripping the stomach open. Obviously, it's very difficult to survive such a wound like that. But for the most part, that wound seems to just be a little bit of a surface wound. I think she'll be fine. She was licking it before. It's incredible how easily lions can heal their wounds by licking them. Elnor, you want to know if we're in Africa or another country or continent? We are most certainly in Africa. We are in East Africa at the moment, in the Mara, in Kenya. And uh, Tristan is a little bit south of us in Tanzania, in the Serengeti. And Trishala and Jamie are down south in South Africa in a reserve next to the Kruger National Park called the Sabi Sands. So we are all in Africa. And all the lions and leopards and animals you're seeing are all alive African animals living in their natural environment. And this is the savannah. The savannah made up of trees and grasses. And depending on where you are, we get different degrees of trees and grass. You'll see the very big difference between Sabi Sands and here. But anyway, we're going to follow this lioness as she moves off. And we're going to send you back down towards the west, David, with his cute sausage tree pride. Yes, classical example of savannah is also what, incidentally, we are framing for you. Uh, that's what Bungay is trying to show you. That's how the Mara savannah looks. And the same savannah you'll see in Serengeti National Park, where Tristan is. And where in the background there is one of the escarpments that I really love, that is called the Olo Lolo Escarpment. The Masai Mara is a huge game reserve, and in this particular corner we are in is called the Mara Triangle, and it's called the Triangle because of that escarpment you see there, and the Mara River and the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania. Apparently, that one female lioness you see nursing there is called Miti, and that's one of her cubs that is suckling. And this particular lioness have a wonderful story. The behavior of one of the sausage tree lionesses does much to affirm the pride's name. Many lions of the Mara enjoy some time in the branches, possibly to escape the attentions of the endless biting flies. But Africa's biggest cats are also the clumsiest, with the notable exception of Miti. Her nickname means trees in Swahili and is a testament to her climbing skills. Among the five lionesses of the pride, Meaty is recognized for having the darkest brown eyes and a tiny cut on her pink nose. At the end of 2018, she mated with one of the Oldonio Payek males.
pregnancy was confirmed by the swollen belly she displayed, sitting in her treetop deck chair in December. For weeks we searched in hope, until finally, in the shade of a magical fig tree, we found them. Three perfect, vulnerable, adorable little lions. Now we watch, sometimes in fear, sometimes in joy, as the little ones navigate the perils of the Mara. We can't wait to follow the lives of these precious little sausages. Well, it's very, very, very exciting that we've managed to find another pair of mating lions not too far from where we just saw those others. And these two are also on rocks, much like the others, and it's probably due to the fact that we had a bit of rain last night. Now, when it rains in the evenings, we often find that the lions move up onto the rocks to get out of the wet grass. And this looks like the female that we had mating with the other uh, male last week, because if you look to the left of that male, you'll see the female lying down. She, I'm sure this is the one that has no tail. So there you go. You can see she's got a tail that is completely missing. And so what happened to that tail? I'm not quite sure. I mean, it's been taken off right at the sort of join. So it could have been hyenas, could have been in a fight with other lions. Um, that's probably what's happened. I've actually had experience with lions losing their tails before where Jamie and Trisha in South Africa, we used to have a pride there that had two females that had no tails and both of them lost their tails to hyenas. So it is very, very, very possible that they ended up losing their tails to that or like I say, maybe other lions that were in the area. But another beautiful, beautiful spot for lions to be able to mate. Paula, do lions notice us? Um, probably not in, in vehicles like this. They've become so accustomed to the cars, much like what we see from South Africa and Kenya. Um, they certainly do notice if you move around. So when you, if you stand up in a vehicle or you move around or around a car, they definitely look and kind of see you. But they don't see us as a threat and they don't definitely don't um, consider us to be something that would hurt them or chase them when we're in vehicles. If you're on foot, very, very different story. So Jamie, she has to be a lot more aware of what she's doing. Um, lions would certainly notice her a lot easier then they would notice us in a vehicle. And you can see these lions are completely unperturbed by us. The female hasn't even lifted her head when we arrived and is still fast, fast, fast asleep under the shade of a tree. And they've actually got a really nice spot in comparison to the other two because they're going to be able to stay there the whole day and stay nice and cool with a bit of a breeze that's blowing, whereas the other two are going to have to try and find a bit of shade. Right, we're going to try and see if we can position ourselves slightly better, see if we can get a bit of a closer view. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to James, who's got the two Cheetah Brothers. Well, I don't think that these cheetah are going to be at all happy about Tristan's lions making more lions, especially as he's had two pairs of lions making more lions. Lions are probably the leading cause of death of cheetah, and so they will not be pleased to hear Tristan's news. Nor, of course, will the wildebeest, which you can see on the hills behind our two cheetah, as we look up into the Masai Mara. they of course also get eaten a lot by lions. Now you can see the big fat belly on that cheetah. He's had a lot to eat over the last little while. And you can see also that the prey, so the wildebeest and all the other herbivores, have created a very large radius around the two cheetah because they know they're here. They will have come past here, seen them, moved out the way, and then slowly they'll forget, basically, and the herds will close up towards the area again until one of them either gets killed or sees the cheetah. And then the radius will form again. And it's actually quite a good way of finding predators out here. You go onto a high point and you look amongst the herds and you find gaps. Vicky, that's a lovely question, and it's interesting because many people think that wildebeest and zebra move massive distances. They don't, actually. The entire trip is probably, if you were to do it from the southern plains up into the western corridor, through the Grometi Game Reserve, and up into the Masai Mara, that whole distance is probably only about 450 kilometers. 
and then ooh, it's probably less than that on the return journey so 450 plus say 350 kilometers or so gives you 800 kilometers let's call it 900 or let's even call it a thousand two hundred given all the circles that they do because they don't walk in a straight line so let's call it a thousand two hundred kilometers and it's actually not very far because they do that over the course of a year so that's only about a hundred and it's only about a hundred kilometers every month which is not massive at all when you think about it. it's less than five kilometers a day i'm afraid my communications are slightly uh, dim in my ear. I can't hear where we're going. We're going to leave these cheetah for now and head somewhere else spectacular. Now we're still here in the dam in the north and I just want you to have a look at how well camouflaged our Dekka is. It's very difficult to pick her out. You can only just see her there we go. So this is going to work well in her favor. And she almost made it out again. But luckily for her, Tandi seems to have moved a little bit south of here. So she was, her trajectory was right towards the dam. And now she's moved a little bit south. So our Dekka here may live another day, which would be awesome. I just wanted to get her strength up. There we go. You can do it. Now remember, she doesn't just need to get out of here. She needs to get out of here into a safe spot because she's going to be heavy with mud. She's going to be wet. She's going to be tired. She needs to rest up in a safe spot and then she will be just fine. She's also being very quiet. She started to huff and heave just a little bit when she was pushing herself up. But the quieter she, rem she remains, the better it is. Animals won't hear her and they won't see her with her gray color against that background of the dry soil oh that looked like a good one i do have faith i think she is going to make it out she's getting there better and better each time she's getting to a dry spot each and every time getting closer and closer to getting out of that spot and i really hope that she does well, I know that you guys are hoping so too, but it's goodbye from us here in South Africa for the moment. So let's send you up to David Kitu in the Mara to say goodbye from us all. I am also wishing uh, that Daika all the very best, Trishala, because... Uh, if she takes rather long there before she comes out, possibility of a leopard coming in there, it's very high, most likely Tandi or maybe Talamba or any other leopard might come and feast it for breakfast. Well, our lioness here is still laying flat and her name, as I said earlier, is Mitty because she's very good when it comes to climbing trees. She got four cubs and one of her cubs is still suckling right now. She must be, he must be very hungry comparing to the other three. And if you look there, you can see a belly of one of a different cub, but as you can see, it's much older. It's much lighter in color. Some nice breeze you can see in the grass there, which is making these lions enjoy exactly where they are bedding now. As I said earlier, they had made a kill two days ago of a buffalo because they're so specialized uh, in hunting buffaloes as much as we got loads of wildebeest that are coming around here where we are that tree there under there is called the shepherd tree or the torture tree and i'm sure they're going to remain there for the better part of the day enjoying the shade of this particular tree beautiful views ladies and gentlemen and what a morning it has been, you know, both from the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, Kruger in South Africa, and here in the Maswi Mara in Kenya. Cheetahs, lions, elephants, you know, all the animals we've been able to see in such lovely weather. Remember, we'll be back again. Join us at 5 o'clock East African time. On behalf of everybody, many thanks and goodbye for now.